Welcome to the Beyond Ordinary Women podcast. Every two weeks, we post podcast versions of one of our free training videos, or you can access our videos now at beyondordinarywomen.org. Enjoy the podcast. Hi, I'm Kay Daigle of Beyond Ordinary Women Ministries, and I am welcoming you to this video podcast. However you're listening or watching, we welcome you. Uh, You can actually go to our website if you'd rather do the other than what you connected to we have the podcast links as well as the video links at beyondordinarywomen.org and i am welcoming today nika spalding who is the resident theologian at saint jude oak cliff which is in the dallas area nika is going to talk right now about the prep before the podium and i specifically ask her we have some other videos already online about just some specifics of how you prepare for a lesson, the things that you do. We have videos about applications and illustrations and things Mm -hmm. like that. But what I wanted to hear from Nika was really how she personally prepares. I thought it would be helpful for our audience, really, Nika, to know what does that really look like? Yeah. What does that really look like? And so when 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 I told her what I wanted, she said that her prep is somewhat Unorthodox. So yeah. that's my first question. Yeah. Uh, how how unorthodox is it, and yeah. why do you say it's unorthodox? Well, I, this is such an invitation because I have often been accused of doing very little preparation because it's so weird. And so my my friends will say I prep for one hour for a twenty minute talk, and I go, that's not true. You only see me prepping for one. Hour. And so I think what's unorthodox about it is I I've seen a lot of people who we we learned a similar method at DTS or wherever you're trained and or. A BSF has one of the most remarkable teaching prep that they do. A lot of my time is spent in my head, and I think that's what it's unorthodox about, is I see a lot of people who journal, who write, who, who take down a ton of data, and I would tell you the majority of my time is spent way before I ever put a pen to the paper really thinking and praying and chewing and meditating. And so that's really step one, is if I know I'm going to teach and I've got a couple weeks out as best as I can, and I, I know some folks teach weekly, so they're not going to get a couple weeks, but... However much time out I have, I'm reading that passage and not doing much else but reading the passage. And during that time, I'm asking myself, what are the things that keep sticking out to me? You know, are there key phrases? Are there questions that when I read it, I'm like, I honestly don't know what that means, you know? And so I don't know what it means. Chances are a lot of people don't know what it means. Or maybe everyone knows what it means, and I'm just not understanding the passage correctly. And so the unorthodox part is people often think I'm not preparing when in fact as I'm driving I'm thinking about it I'm reading it multiple times um, and before I'm even digging into the resources and just asking the Lord what is it that what seems to be the main idea that keeps bubbling up and one of the things my friends will tell you is I always kind of tip my hand to what I'm going to be teaching is because I start talking to people about it I'll be like hey have you ever read Romans 8 what do you think of it and just you know trying to bring it into my normal conversation with folks to get an idea of what is it when people encounter this particular passage what are they thinking about? What are the questions they have? What is the Lord putting on their heart? And so that's a huge chunk of my time. After that, then I go to the resources. And I would say for anybody who plans to teach, uh, you know, reading commentaries and reading diverse commentaries. And what I mean by that is reading folks maybe who from a reform tradition and those from a dispensational or those, and not necessarily to have them compete and fight, but just to say, gosh, is there something that for 2,000 years we've all agreed upon and we think this is the main point of the passage? If everyone's saying that, that's probably the main point of the passage. And so you get to stand on the shoulders of giants. And so that's what I'd say is I spend a lot of time just with the Lord in the passage going, I really do believe the Holy Spirit is alive and active. I really do believe he's the one that reveals so much truth to us. But then, because of the mercy and the grace of God, then he gives us scholars and thinkers that we get to stand on their shoulders. And so then I go, um, I would say at a minimum, I'm consulting at least three commentaries per message, uh, maybe more. It depends, especially if you're in a passage. That maybe there is a little bit of disagreement throughout church history. Then I'm, you know, I might look at even more. And so I do that. And then, and then after that, it's more simmering. I mean, it's more just kind of thinking, having conversations. I love to to chat with folks who have taught on it. I love to listen to other people who have taught on it and try and get as many voices as I can, which may sound schizophrenic, but what I think God is doing through that time is it's bubbling up what are the main ideas. Because 
one thing scholars like to do is we like to find the most obscure part of the passage and spend all of our time on it. And this process allows me to be like, okay, well, I think that's fascinating. Most of the church does not think that's fascinating. And so I could probably chop that off or only spend one minute of my, my talking time addressing that. Um, and so that's a lot of it. And then after all of that simmering, I really try and draw, okay, what's the main idea or main ideas? Any, any more than three or four main ideas, it's not that you can't do that. I just think it's hard for people to remember that. Uh, and we live in a day and age where you really want people being able to walk out and, and retell what you've said. I've, I've been at the mercy of, I have a really great metaphor and people only remember the metaphor and not the main point. And so I'm really going, okay, what if I could get them to walk out of here knowing something, believing something, or doing something, what would that be based on this passage? And so I really put a pen to paper at that point. And then I have guardrails because I don't trust myself. And so I've developed these guardrails over the years. Uh, and so one of, the, one of the things I asked when I finally put a pen to the paper is, is this interpretation really exalting Christ? And what I mean by that is there's some passages where we tend to exalt the human component of it, or we stick ourselves in the scripture um, like one of the examples people love to give is David and Goliath, and they really teach on David and Goliath, and like, you could be a David, you just need to go get stones. And while that's a very appropriate application, Christ is our hero, Christ is our savior, Christ is David in that moment. David is the precursor to Christ, not to me. And so whatever interpretation the passage I'm going to give, the first question I ask, is this really exalting Christ, is this exalting the Trinity, or is it sneakily a way for me to tell stories about myself that I really want to tell? Because there's another time and place for that. Um, <laughs> So that's what I'll do. And then that's one of the first questions. And the people are going to ask, well, why do you ask that question? John 5 is such an instructive passage. Jesus is going and confronting the religious leaders of his day. And, and Pharisees sometimes get a bad rap. We just think they're jerks. We don't get the full story that they are truly religious folks who spent their time studying the Word of God. They knew the Word of God. And Jesus comes to them and he says, you search the Scriptures because in them you think you find eternal life. But I'm telling you, they testify about me. And so that's why that safeguards there is Jesus himself says this book is so important because it's talking about me and it's revealing my father and it's revealing the spirit. And so that's why does this exalt Christ is one of the safeguards that I have in place. Um, the other question I ask is, is it true always for all people and at all times? And this is, you've heard people ask this all the time, but it's a good question to ask because I, I'm, a, I'm a white woman born in 1985 and I might be teaching something that I can't take that message to Rwanda because it's not true there, or I can't take that message to 1940s wherever. And so I think that's just a good safeguard for all of us because we come to the text with our own biases. And so as best I can, I try and take my shoes off and walk in the shoes of others to say, could other men and women throughout history and in different spaces and time look at this passage and go, oh yeah, yeah, we see the same thing. That is still true today. It was true yesterday. It will be true forever. And then just this personal one that I've developed, um, because I, I like to teach the Old Testament a lot, because I think people avoid it, because it's scary and weird. And we I'm so with you. <laughs> Thank you. I love yeah. the Old Testament. Yeah, and I get that in light of the, the cross, that things change in the Old Testament, but it is, all scripture is God-breathed and, and profitable, and so I'm making a niche market by hanging out in the Old Testament. The Old Testament has some wonky things, right? I mean, there's some passages that we scratch our head at, and so I have these statements that I, that I say that, that any view of God that I have cannot violate them, and that is God is good and God does good, and we get that from Psalm 119, that God loves me no matter what, and we got that from 1 John, that God is love and he does love, and so he cannot violate his character in that way, and then the third one, that God is pleased with me, and that applies only to believers, but in light of the cross, in Romans 8, there's no condemnation, so if I begin ever teaching a message of shame or a message of man, God's a jerk, and look what he does to sinners. Like, that's not true of God's character, and that's not true of how he feels about me. And so those are, those are questions I literally impose upon the text and say, is my understanding of this going to violate any of these? And if it does, I have to keep studying. I, it's me that's failing here, not the Word and not God. And so I think those are really healthy boundaries. And then the final thing, and this is snuck into all of my teaching, I think I'm, gonna, I'm starting to get mocked by some of my people because they're like, and as Niger would say, so what? Uh, but I end every message with, so what? And, and it, I say it so directly like that because, again, being a scholar, there are times that I think something's really neat and it was edifying to me, but I don't know that I always helped people to make the bridge to 
what does this matter to you? The, the mom who is overwhelmed because she's got three kids under the age of four and her husband's on a work trip, or the person who's up on the 10th floor of Children's Medical and they're looking at their sick child, or the husband who just lost his job and he's not sure, like, what, am I, what does what I'm saying matter to them? Because I believe what God says, that scripture is profitable, teaching, correcting, rebuking, and training in righteousness, and it's a comfort, and it's a revelation of who God is. And so is what I'm doing just a really fun exercise in Bible study, or is what I'm doing actually nourishment to the people that God has put in front of me to teach in women's Bible studies and mops groups and things like that? And so that is a question that I always, so what? And if you can't answer that as a teacher, I, go back to the drawing board. And so, so Rika, I spent a lot of time looking as if I'm not preparing, but it's simmering and it's simmering. And then I have these safeguards in place as I ask these questions in the text. And then I always end with, okay, does this matter to Kay Daigle or does this just matter to me? Because I thought this was super neat. And people are going to be impressed with what I have to say, but are they not going to leave transformed, loving God more, encouraged and nourished by the word? Because this is... The word of God is nourishment for us, and it's revelation of who God is. And so if I will do those things, then I can get out of the way, and God's word can really be exalted as I, as I bring the message to the folks that God's put in front of me. Thank you, Nika. Yeah. Yeah. And, and not everybody does it exactly the way That's you exactly do. That's exactly right, yeah. Some yeah. people take copious notes. Yeah. Now, I'm probably more in your camp, but yeah. some people have to just start writing things That's down. Right. And so... So we're not giving this to you to yeah. say everybody needs to do it like Micah, but she has given some great principles about your teaching and about your preparation for, for doing that that I think any person who gets up and takes the Word of God before other people can benefit from. Yeah. So I really appreciate you Thank sharing you. that with us. And uh, we have some other videos on teaching. Just go to our website, beyondordinarywomen.org and look at our resources and we have help for you if you are teaching the word of god mm -hmm. and we will continue to put up more resources so be sure and contact us if you have something you that would be helpful to you we might just do a video or podcast of it thanks Nika. thanks for listening to the beyond ordinary women podcast you can find more podcasts and information about women in leadership by going to beyond ordinary women Org. This podcast was produced by Beyond Ordinary Women Ministries. Our production team includes Evelyn Babcock, Kay Daigle, Kay Halligan, Deborah Herring, Sharifa Stevens, and John Sparks. Theme music, Back in Stride by Don Miller, used by courtesy of Christine Miller.